Appreciate y'all braving this today. All right. Well, good morning. Again, good morning to all who are here, who all may be listening online and who may be listening in the future to this teaching. Pray that God will bless you. Father, we thank you for this precious time to come together. Lord, and to look at your word. It may be cold outside, Lord, but our hearts are warmed knowing your love, knowing your blessings, knowing the gift of your son, knowing the absolutely settled and unmovable foundations that you've placed into our lives, and we are so grateful. So Lord, we ask you as we continue studying your precious word that you open our understanding, that Lord, we'll see what it means to us as you are teaching these disciples, you are also teaching us, Lord, it's written for us on whom the end of the ages has come. So Lord, thank you for all your gifts, all your blessings, all your all that you've done for us, Lord God, your, your holy and faithful word. And Holy Spirit, we ask you to teach us this day. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to start this teaching with coming up with a working definition of a word that you've all heard. But it's going to have a lot of bearing on today's teaching. And in fact, if I would title this sermon today, I would title it, The Power of a Paradigm. I didn't run into that word much until I got into the corporate world and I'd end up going into staff meetings and you'd always hear people say, well, you know, you, you got to break out of your paradigm. You got to think outside the box. You got to be willing to look at things in new ways and so on. Well, let's look at a definition of a paradigm. Paradigm is a way of thinking about things based upon a system of beliefs, ideas, values, and habits. Basically, it's how we believe about something. Actually, if you go into, the, into your laptop and plug that in and say, what is the meaning of this word? There are some very, very extensive definitions of this. So I've tried to simplify it pretty much. It's just how we believe about something. It's a, the opinions that we formed. It's how we believe. It's what we believe. It's our viewpoint about things. And it doesn't come overnight. You don't form a paradigm overnight. It builds over time. And not, not all paradigms are wrong. In fact, if, if your paradigm is based on the right things then, you know, Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior, and He's the only way to God. That's my paradigm. That's a good paradigm to have. I don't want to think outside that box. That's the box that I live in. That's the box that is truth, and so on. But it can be that sometimes we, you know, you look, look at Paul. Talk about a shift in a paradigm from what he believed on the road to Damascus and what he believed by the time he got to Damascus. His paradigm got crushed. So it can happen. And it's going to very much influence what our teaching is today. We have, uh, we have built up to this chapter, to this part of Mark 8, verses 27 through 33. It is the high point of the gospel of Mark. Everything else is still important, but this is what everything has been built up to. In fact, the next event that we will study in Mark, as told to him by Peter, is such a life-changing event that it is recorded in all of the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. To me, this is another reason to trust the veracity of the Gospels. Peter tells Mark the whole story. Now, if you and I were going to sit down, and we had a secretary or a friend that was going to write down our memoirs as we would recite them to them, we would probably have a tendency to clean some things up. Every one of us. Every one of us, if not clean things up, there might be just some things we'd just rather not talk about. We'd rather just avoid... Uh, and so on. And Peter could have well done this, he, but he tells Mark the whole story, a story of the greatest high and of the greatest low, and, and that's one of the reasons that, that I believe in, again, this veracity of the gospel. You know, in ancient times, the reason that so often they don't accept ancient history as fact is that they know that many of the events are skewered to make the leaders look good. Success was inflated and failures were eliminated. The ancient pharaohs, when assuming power, would often have every inscription and every statue of the previous administration carved away. Then they would rewrite history to make themselves look good. Peter didn't have to tell Mark the whole story, but he did. And we'll see Peter receive a great commendation from the Lord. Only moments before later, he will receive the greatest condemnation. And just as a side note for those who, this came to me last Wednesday and I shared it, that as a side note for those who think the Gospels are not inspired, which means God breathed. You know, there's people out there, there are people, just think about it, if people say to you, you know, we're studying, you know, what are you doing in church? Oh, we're studying Mark. You know, I don't believe that. I don't believe those books are, I think that's just man writing their ideas down. I don't believe God had a thing to do with it. Well, think about this. 
Just a side note, note for those who think that way. Think for a moment of what we have already seen in the first half of Mark's gospel. Miraculous healings, le uh, legions of demons cast out, thousands fed miraculously, a man walking on water, commanding the elements. If Peter was making all this up, he is the greatest writer since Stephen King. Do you ever think about that? When people say that stupid thing, oh, I don't believe that's really the word of God. I think these are these stories that people made up. Well, these had most of them imaginative minds in the world to have thought of what were the things we're talking about here. I mean, you think about that. Here's this guy in a, in a prison cell in Rome going to make all this stuff up and tell it to Mark. He, he, had, he had to be studying on this, thinking about this, planning this. You know, well, I wonder what his next novel was going to be. But anyway, let's read today what the story we want to go over. Now, Jesus and his disciples went out to the towns of Caesarea Philippi, and on the road, he asked his disciples, saying to them, who do men say that I am? And they answered, John the Baptist, and some say Elijah, and others one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? If you've been following along with us, you know that this is everything Jesus has been working up to. Who do you say that I am? And Peter answered and said, you are the Christ. Then he charged them that they should tell no one about him. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke this word openly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when he had turned around and looked at his disciples, <coughs> excuse me, he rebuked Peter saying, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but of the things of men. So we'll start in verse 27. Now Jesus and his disciples went out to the towns of Caesarea Philippi. And on the road, he asked his disciples, saying to them, Who do men say that I am? On the road, in the classroom of the Messiah. Think about that. I would have loved to have been there. His, his schoolroom was nature. Surrounded by all that he had created, he he conducted his teaching on the walking paths of Israel under the open sky. I would have loved to have been on the road with Jesus. The informal banter back and forth of these, as these men are walking, listening to Jesus, debating among themselves, talking. The give and take of, of learning, processing, and trying to come to grips with all of his teaching. To walk with God and to hear the mysteries of the kingdom. I don't know about you, but I'd love to have been on a walk with Jesus. I, I love an informal type teaching. Uh, I, I, I miss walking out there amongst you like I was, did this morning because of the, the filming and, you know, all the things that have been going on. But uh, I want to get back to that, that informal give and take of teaching. They are being prepared by the Savior to be the foundations on which his church will be built. Jesus was leading them to a world-changing revelation. They had followed him for two and a half years. They weren't always the quickest to learn. We've seen that. But they stayed. They were loyal to him. And now the teacher knew that they were prepared to answer his next question. He asked them, who do men say that I am? This is how the Spirit gave it to me. He said the disciples had enough revelation to be saved. See, Jesus couldn't have asked that question earlier. He knew the right time to ask the question. The disciples had enough revelation now to be saved. Galilee had enough revelation to be judged. The revelation that saves one is the same revelation that condemns another. Paul captured this in three verses. and We've gone over this many times, but it's so beautiful. Paul writes, now thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ. And through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. For we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. Notice that it is the exact same smell. It is the exact same aroma. It hasn't changed one bit. But to the one it is the fragrance of Christ to those who are being saved. And the very same smell to, uh, to those who are perishing. To the one we are the aroma of death unto death, and the other we are the aroma of life unto life. So we understand that that same revelation 
produces two different effects, but it's the exact same thing. So here you have all this revelation, all this light that Jesus has been bringing into Galilee. Two and a half years of spreading light. Two and a half years of, and all they had was enough knowledge to be judged, and his disciples had enough knowledge, enough light to be saved. Revelation can be deadly because revelation requires a response. I've told you this story before. It's almost become a parable in my own thinking, but i like to share it with you in case you hadn't heard it. I remember my pastor years ago when I was a boy in the Lutheran church told a story about how he was invited to speak at a church in the inner city in St. Louis. And if you're familiar at all with St. Louis, you know that in a lot of the older neighborhoods there were alleyways behind buildings, behind churches, behind houses. People would use their alleyways and the dump trucks would come through there and different things. It was the way to get to your garage, which was normally in the back of the yard and so on. So he's heading for this church, for this conference that he was supposed to speak at. And there was construction going on on a house next to the church or a building, whatever it was, but there was construction going on there. And they had a um, cement truck that was backing up to get into that place where they were doing this construction next to the church. So one of the workers had taken a sign because it was a construction zone years ago. They had a sign that said danger zone. And the truck couldn't get back on the, on the road into that alleyway unless they moved the sign. So the man just took the sign, set it over in front of the church. So everybody that walked by the church had said the church was a danger zone. That's good to remember because he said, you know, the truth of it is the church is a danger zone. If you're playing games with God and you're coming to church and hearing revelation and not responding and walking in that revelation, you have put yourself in a world of hurt. Revelation can be a blessing and revelation can be deadly. There was enough revelation to, to Galilee that they could be judged. There was enough revelation to the disciples that they could be saved. Same revelation. So we need to remember that, that, that you know, if, if, if people are playing games, and I don't mean here, but I just know that there are people sitting in churches today that are hearing truth but not walking in it, not responding to it. And the worst thing you can do is, is hear the truth and then not walk in it. Because you might say, well, I, you, you might not walk in it and think it's okay. No, it's not okay. You will be judged for it. Let's look at what Jesus said in John. Then Jesus said to them, a little while longer, the light is with you. Walk while you have the light. Live it out. Walk it out while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. Because he who walks in darkness does not know where he's going. While you have the light, believe in the light, that you may become sons of the light. These things Jesus spoke and departed and was hidden from them. But although he had done so many things before them, they did not believe in him. Nevertheless, even among the rulers, many believed in him because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him lest they should be put out of the synagogue for they loved the praises of men more than the praise of God. Then Jesus cried out and said, he who believes in me believes not in me, but in him who sent me. I have come as a light into the world, and whoever believes in me should not abide in darkness. And if anyone hears my words and does not believe, I do not judge him. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. He who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me gave me a command that what I should say and what I should speak. And I know his command is everlasting life. Therefore, whatever I speak, just as the Father told me, so I speak. Jesus making it very clear there that if you don't accept or walk in the light that has been given, it will be a tremendous judgment about it. So I repeat, Galilee had enough light to be judged. The disciples, the apostles had enough light to be saved. Their, con their confession of Jesus Christ comes with this question. Who do men say that I am? The word men here in the Greek means the general population, the everyday folks, the Joe Sixback, Joe the plumber. The disciples, having come from Galilee, were very able to answer that question. Notice that when he asked that, who do men say that I am? They don't say, well, give us a minute to talk about it. Give us a minute to discuss about it. Give us a minute to think about it. They have an immediate answer because they're close to the people. 
Galilee, for the most of them, is home base. This is their hometown. This is where they, their, their families had lived for a long time. And they knew what the people were saying. And they answered, John the Baptist, but some say Elijah, and others the prophets. Jesus was the closest thing the people had seen to the ministry of John the Baptist. Many thought that John was the light. That was the only reference point this generation had. Some said that he was Elijah. They knew that the prophet Malachi had spoken for God, saying, Behold, I will send Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. If he wasn't physically Elijah, they believed he was under Elijah's anointing. And i got to say something right here. I saw something on cable the other night. It truly bothered me. We know the story of Elisha and Elijah, and he prayed that he would have the, prophet, the, the prophet's uh, anointing, and you know his cloak comes down, and he strikes the water with the cloak, and he has tr actually twice the amount. There are, there are churches, guys, you know, sometimes you think I'm making this stuff up. There are churches that are out there teaching people that if they know where a good Bible scholar is buried, that they should lay on the grave and absorb the anointing. And I literally saw pictures of these people literally laying on the ground on the graves to absorb the anointing of who might be buried six feet under them. Please, when I'm dead. Well, I said good teachers. I'm worried, but don't don't lay on my grave. <laughs> Isn't that ridiculous? Amazing what people do. Do you realize when they answered this question? You know, it's kind of like when when God told Moses not to come any nearer, but to take his shoes off because he was on holy ground. I've always taught you what a sad sad moment that was you don't hear that but it was a sad moment because that isn't what God wanted God always wanted his creatures to come to him to be near him to be with him and it was hard for God to say to Moses stop don't come any further well this was hard also this is the answer for who Jesus is after two and a half years of light how sad that that's the answer. Jesus has shown into their lives for two and a half years, doing things only God could do, but they reject him. They equate him to a human prophet. They not only reject him, they reject the Spirit of God that gave them the ability to see the light. Why couldn't or wouldn't they receive him as their God-given Messiah? The answer is simply, the power of a paradigm. The power of a paradigm. They had a very highly developed concept of the role of the Messiah. He would wield political power. He would be a military leader who would organize an army and overthrow the Roman tyranny. He would make Israel the greatest nation in the world. But Jesus, in spite of all the miracles he accomplished, just didn't fit the bill. He didn't fit their paradigm. He didn't act like a king. He didn't look like a king. He fell short of their expectations. He looked like a prophet. And that would get them judged. But the same light had been shining on the disciples. And so he asked them this. But he said to them, But who do you say that I am? The you there is plural. Peter is the spokesman for the group, so he answers. But this was addressed to all the disciples. And you need to know there were more disciples around than just the 12. A handful of others were there. So anyway, he, 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 this is a plural question to all of them. Who do you say that I am? And he says, you are. Peter, speaking for the group, says, you are the Christ. This, of course, is the most important question anyone will ever answer. It is the question that is asked in the conscience of every person who has ever been born or will ever be born. Our eternal destination is determined by our answer. This is the high point. This is the pinnacle of the Gospel of Mark. Everything that has transpired has led up to this moment. Everything that is going to transpire comes from this moment. Peter is now their established spokesperson. He answers for all of them. He says, you are the Christ. Matthew adds that he says, and the son of the living God. 
This is the moment in time when the disciples settle the issue of who Jesus is. This is the moment they believe. This is the moment they confess. This is what Jesus has been working for hand in hand with the Holy Spirit. Yeah, you know, this is what Jesus this is what Jesus is trying to bring everybody to. He leads us into truth. That's something again we need to understand. He has led them up to this moment. When Jesus left and he told the disciples, he says, it's better for you that I leave because I'll send the Spirit, I will send the, the Holy Ghost, I will send the Comforter, he will be another me to you. And he says he will guide you. If you look that up in the Greek, it means the same thing, the same word. He will lead you into all truth. So this is, this, this is you know, Jesus just doesn't slam you with salvation. If you find in most people, even if they say that they were saved at a crusade or made a decision, it's normally based on being led up to that point. And Jesus had been leading these men and leading these men up to this point. And, and here's the thing that, that I think is interesting. This is what Jesus lives for. This is what Jesus lives for. And it's not about the title, and it's not about the worship. Why is Jesus so emphatically determined that they must know that he is the Christ and he is the Son of God. He doesn't want the title and he doesn't want the worship. You know what he wants? He wants to impart to them, and now he can, for the first time, he can impart to them eternal life. He can impart to them eternal life because now they have confessed he is the Christ. He is the Son of God. This is what Jesus lives for. Remember, it's something that we never want to forget. In the book of Hebrews, when, and you know, we, we talk so often about all the torture that Jesus went through. Uh, even the passion of the Christ couldn't begin to show the real picture of everything Jesus went through. And you certainly can't picture all the spiritual aspects of the torture that he went through. And the Bible says in the book of Hebrews that Jesus went through all that for the joy that was set before him. And you find out that that joy is his bride, that that joy is the people of God, that that joy is you and me. And he went through it all for us. He ever lives to make intercession for us. He ever lives to bless us and the reason Jesus won because remember what we just read when Jesus was saying that I'm the light you should accept me now while you have the light he said I don't speak my own word you're judged by the word that I bring you not by me but by the word because it's the word of my father who has commanded eternal life he has commanded Jesus for eternal life and so all this leading all this prior, and this is the eternal life he wanted to give to every person in Galilee Two and a half years of the same life. One comes to the conclusion that best he's a prophet. One comes to the conclusion he's the son of God. The very same life. One will receive eternal life. One will receive judgment. You know, it's, I made a note here. It reminds me of, of Abraham. When he left Ur of the Chaldeans. And he came into the land of promise. You know, he was, a, he was a wealthy man, wealthy man before he ever went on that trip. And you notice that in all his wanderings, in all the years that he lived and had his children and so on, he never built a house. He never built a house. You know why he didn't build a house? Why did Abraham live in a tent when he didn't have to live in a tent? He could afford to build a house. We're told that Abraham saw a city on a hill whose builder and maker was God. And once he saw that, he wouldn't build a house because he could build nothing to compare it with what he saw. He was going to stay in that tent until he got the city. And that reminds me because he had a vision of something. Jesus has a vision of, a, a, you know, it's... it's for all the mistakes and dumb things that we talked about earlier that happened in churches, the church is still Jesus' idea. The church is still a redeemed community that, that he has a great vision for. And, it, you know, you, you, if, if our God was a selfish God, he would be wanting the praise. He would want the adulation. He would want, to, want the titles that come with it all. All he wanted to do was fulfill the Father's command, give them eternal life. That's what he lives for. It's what he wants. It's what he works hand in hand with the Holy Spirit for. But at this point, then, it finally brings us back, if you'll remember, to how this all starts, Mark 1.1, 1, 1, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That's how Peter started all this. For the disciples, this is probably not the first time that they have believed this, or otherwise they wouldn't have to walked away from family businesses, local communities, 
the traditions of Judaism that had grounded their lives. Besides, they had the witness of John the Baptist who declared right from the start that Jesus was the Son of God. Yet they still struggled with this. Not because they hadn't seen the evidences of divine power, but he just didn't match up to their paradigm of what Messiah would be. That's the power of a paradigm. Plus, he had never been declared by the religious leaders of the nation as the Messiah. And wouldn't they know? But now for them, for these disciples that are following Jesus, the issue is eternally settled. You are the Christ. You are the Son of God. And this was not just the result of thoughtful introspection and debate. Because immediately after that confession, according to Matthew, Jesus said this. And Jesus said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. The question requires divine intervention. Paul said this in Corinthians, Therefore I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed, and no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Then Jesus says this, Then he charged them, that they should tell no one about it. You know, we have fought this, trying to understand this, but today it becomes crystal clear, and you'll see it in a moment. And he began to teach them. That he, he began to teach them that the, the, uh, they be, he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed, and after three days rise again. Being, it says here that he began, this means that this was the theme of his ministry. It wasn't a one-time thing. This is now how he begins to teach them. We told you that his, his public ministry is over as far as to the crowds. Now he's concentrating on the disciples. And right on top of this marvelous revelation of his person comes this dark revelation of his death. He is going to be killed. He goes from Son of God and Messiah to many sufferings, rejection, and finally death. Think about it. I mean, you know, this, this was his... That moment in time to have been there, just a few moments ago, when he praises Peter for making that statement, he actually praises all of them to come to this conclusion that he is the Christ, he is the Son of God, and now he's telling them how he's going to die. If you were there, if you were a disciple, if you had just made this wonderful revelation and, and gotten that commendation that this was a, a, the, the, everything that God wanted for them to believe, that he is the Christ, the Son of God, and now all of a sudden he says, and I'm going to die. They couldn't get their heads around it. You can't really blame them. That's a lot to take in in one moment. How did they get their heads around this? We read this. And he spoke the word openly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. You got to love Peter. The audacity of Peter. I love Peter. If there's hope for Peter, there's hope for me. You talk about a guy that does dumb things. Now, he's just said, this is the Son of God. Now, the Son of God is standing right here. And the Son of God just makes this statement that he's going to have this rejection and he's going to have to suffer and he's going to die. They didn't even hear the point that he's going to rise on the third day. All they hear is that their God is going to die, that their Messiah is going to die, their King is going to die. So what does he do? He grabs you. Come here, we've got to go for a talk. Can you just see me? This, he knows now he's the Son of God. He should have been on his face worshiping. Instead he grabs him by the arm and says, we're going to talk. You mind if I have a word? But he's not going to do it publicly. He doesn't want to show Jesus' insanity in front of the others. So he takes him by the arm and pulls him over. Again, you've got to appreciate the audacity. He grabs the Son of God. He says, come here. He doesn't want to question Jesus' authority in the sight of the other disciples. Having settled the issue of who Jesus is, there's still great com- confusion about the plan. They affirm the person, but they deny the plan. You understand? They've accepted Jesus. So now that paradigm is there. They've accepted Jesus, but in the plan, they can't accept it because that, that doesn't match their paradigm. The whole history of Israel has pointed to the coming of this man, this Messiah, as a synagogue son of Abraham, the disciples would have been familiar with the prophetic promises of what the Messiah would accomplish. Most basically, the liberation and exaltation of the Jewish people. Listen to me, I'm going to tell you. This is what these men believe. 
Most basically, the liberation and exaltation of the Jewish people, a return to the glory of the days of David and Solomon. The Lord would be, the, the land would be renewed, prosperity would flow. That's what they wanted, that's what they expected, and that was their paradigm. That's why they followed Jesus in the first place. They have followed him for two and a half years, waiting for him to stake his claim to the throne of Israel, and now they confess he is the one, and next comes this very dark revelation that he's going to be killed. And it wasn't that they misunderstood the message, because it says Jesus spoke the word openly in the Greek. That means very plainly, very clearly, very boldly. He's, he's being, he's talking about it over and over again. But the disciples can't accept the plan. At this point, the cross was foolishness to them. So much so that Peter grabs him. To bring, and to bring Jesus to his sentence. Sentence says, can you understand now why he told them not to go out and talk about this to anyone? They've just been told what the plan is, and they've just said, we don't want it. We say, well, why would Jesus tell these perfectly good men that he's been training for two and a half years not to go out and, spare, shed the, and, and, and spread the gospel? Because they don't know the gospel. They don't know what you know. This Jesus has just shot everything out from under him. Matthew records at this, but he turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. He's just had this commendation. Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood didn't show you this, but my Father in heaven. Now all of a sudden, get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but of the things of men. In the Greek, it literally says that Peter said, God grant you better than this. This can't happen to you. I want to ask you a question. Have you ever rebuked the Lord? Yes, you have. Oh, no. Any time that God didn't fulfill the paradigm of what you... Do you, do you realize... And I don't mean here because I know you're spiritual maturity. But do you realize how many Christians had their paradigm crushed over this election? Do you know how many Christians are rebuking the Lord because he didn't put Trump in office? Mary and Martha rebuked him. They had a paradigm. Send, send a, you know, they send a runner. Go, 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 go get Jesus. You don't even have to tell him it's last. Tell him the one that he loves is sick. He'll know. So they had that paradigm that they built up of what Jesus would do. And Jesus will come and Lazarus will live because Jesus will be here because this is the man he loves. And that's what we understand about Jesus. And of course, he shows on the fourth day and Lazarus stinks. And they very politely, but they rebuke him. Lord, if you had just been here, if you had just done what I believed you would do, if you had just met my paradigm of what I believed about you, do you see how a paradigm can get you in trouble? They're not always good. That's why you've got to make sure you've got a good paradigm of how you think about things. I wonder, how, I don't know the whole story. I don't, none of us knows the whole story of how, who all those people were that went into the Capitol building. I understand the frustration I understand it. Believe me. I'm as frustrated about it as anybody else. But how many of those took that on themselves because their paradigm of what God would do was shattered? Think about it. When God doesn't save a loved one like Lazarus. Have you rebuked him? Did you rebuke him because you didn't get the job, you didn't get this, or that didn't happen, or a child didn't do this, or accomplished this that you wanted or thought? We've got to be careful about paradigms. Because one paradigm has been broken about the Messiah. Now they know who he is, they confess who he is, and they have, they have bought into the man, but they, their paradigm of what the Messiah... You know, and actually, at this stage, they're really no different than the people of Galilee. They just acknowledge who he is, but they just think he's going to do something entirely different. And when he doesn't, it's just shattering to them. They can't accept the fact they rebuke him. They rebuke him for shattering their paradigm. So 
It's hard to accept because paradigms don't come overnight. When we talk about a shattered paradigm, I always go back to Paul to have had, I mean, talk about the shattered paradigm. Has to sit in darkness for three days just to try to compensate for what he heard. And had to rethink things all over again. It's a strong rebuke from Jesus, but he can't afford to be gentle about this, and neither can the disciples, and neither can you. Peter's paradigm just couldn't allow for the will of God. Matthew records that Jesus called Peter an offense, a stumbling block in his path. Jesus is saying that anything, anything that tries to derail the will of God is demonic. And all I can say is, poor Peter, the guy really thought that he was being loving and trying to be understanding. And he was trying to bring Jesus back to his senses. And he gets called Satan. He gets told the same thing Satan was told in the desert when he was tempting Jesus, get behind me. In other words, literally what that means is get out of my sight. So he tells Peter to get out. You know, this is again what I told you. Peter didn't have to tell Mark the whole story. He could have stopped with, blessed are you! He told me I'm blessed because... I had that revelation from God. Jesus is the Christ. Father showed me that. I don't want to tell you that 10 minutes later I was being called Satan because I couldn't buy into the plan. You can't help but sorry for him. But you know, there's something we learn out of that. That he loved the Lord and he was trying to spare the Lord. He was saying, oh, we're not going down this road. Sometimes the advice of loved ones isn't always the best advice. Sometimes people, because they love you, will tell you to do something or advise you to do something because the road otherwise is going to be hard, but it may be exactly where God wants you to go. Just be careful with that. The Bible says, faithful are the wounds of a friend, but not always is you know, the Bible says that there's wisdom in a multitude of counselors. It only works if you have good counselors who know the Word of God. Because I've had a lot of counsel in my life. I was told how stupid I was to go into ministry. I was told that I would regret it. I was told that the butter, my butter and bread was at McDonald Douglas and I shouldn't leave. I had a lot of people tell me things over the years. But it didn't always coincide with what God wanted to do. It would have been easier to go the routes that they said. But it isn't always easier. So appreciate your loved ones, but just because they give you advice doesn't always make it right. So I appreciate Peter for what he did. He didn't spare himself in his memoirs. It was a hard lesson to be learned, but it was a lesson learned. And later in his ministry, he would write this. And when he had turned around and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter saying this. Peter's paradigm could not allow for the will of God. And Peter would write this later. Jesus himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness by whose stripes we are healed. Now he can go out and share the gospel. Now he understands the paradigm. He's got a new paradigm now on this. So religion isn't a game. You guys know that. Churches can be danger place, dangerous places. If the whole church is playing games, that's one thing. But if, if truth is being taught, if revelation is being brought, if the Spirit of God is at work, there's a responsibility to respond to what you hear. And I don't know if that's happening all the time, but people will form their paradigms. Just make sure you get a good one. That's why somebody once said, Make sure you get a good theology because everybody has one and they certainly do. So let's pray. Father, I thank you for, because Lord, what we see in your leading of these apostles is the same leading you brought to each and every one of us. Salvation didn't come at the drop of a hat in any of our lives. The decision to acknowledge you as Lord and Savior was a process, a process of revelation, light here, light there, beginning to walk in the, what light we knew, what light we understood. And as we would walk in light, you would bring more light. That's another thing we didn't say, but it's true. More light comes with obedience to the light that you have. 
You can't get more. God isn't going to waste his time bringing more light into your life if you won't walk in the light that he's given you. But Lord, we've, we've learned that as we walk in that light and we accept you and then we keep growing in grace and Lord, you keep showing more light into our lives and we're grateful. Because Lord, your, your word, your word is as vital and life-changing and powerful today. We're not just reading about Peter's memoirs, we're reading the word of God. That word that is so sharp that it can divide asunder bones and marrow and spirit and soul and body. So Lord, just... Uh, Help us to refire our lives, to rededicate ourselves to you, Lord God, to know as we know that time is short, and Lord, to trust you and to have, not to rebuke you when you go outside of our paradigm. Let our paradigms be not so stiff that we can somehow miss your will and what you're trying to do. Look at me a second. One thing I forgot to tell you, I want to tell you another story because it bears on this. Ben's probably the only one other, other than me that will remember this story because he was around back then. There was a man, young man, family, came to church. And he had definitely went full bore into the faith, you know, just name it, claim it, confess it. There's a right in that, and as you know, there's a wrong in that. And he had his paradigm of God. His little girl got hurt in a bicycle accident. Somehow the handlebar, whatever. I can't remember all the specifics. It's been a lot of years ago, but the gist of it was she got hurt. I think the handlebar went into her somehow, and she needed immediate surgery. And so he, as the father, had to give his permission for his daughter to have surgery, and they're, 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 they're waiting. They are waiting to start performing a surgery. She needs it. She needs it now. You have to give your permission, and he did not know what to do because this whole accident was totally out of the paradigm of what he believed God would ever allow to happen in his life. His little girl almost died because the dad's paradigm had been shattered and he did not know how to respond because he had a false paradigm. That's, I, that may be the best way I could end this lesson for you to understand what I'm talking about, about paradigms. But he finally had to give permission, but it wasn't just once he gave permission it was over. He had to rethink everything. But it's probably good that he did to get a good theology. But that's the power of a paradigm. So, Lord, keep us from wrong paradigms, Lord, but strengthen those that we have that are right and true. Because, Lord, we want to contend for this faith that has been handed down to the saints. Lord, in this day and age when everything is being adulterated, when everything is being watered down, when everything is being bad is good and good is bad, Lord, we have your holy word to hold on to. We want to have a, a world viewpoint, a biblical viewpoint that is a, a good paradigm of you. And to stand on that truth. So Lord, you use us and help us to shape other people's paradigms, Lord God, about the true God that we've come to know, we've come to love, we've come to respect, we've come to worship. The God who has commanded for us eternal life. And we thank you for it, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Don't know for sure if the weather does come to 12 below next Sunday, we're not going to be here. We are not going to have Wednesday night this week and uh, we'll get back to it so God bless